morning, Southside. As a church, we are studying through Paul's epistle to the Romans. We are currently in chapter 9. If you'll turn to Romans chapter 9, just a beautiful section, and the timing is perfect as always. We're being reminded of the sovereignty of God and His grace and His glory, His ways, His dealings with mankind, the, the reasons for why God does what He does, His this morning, we're going to really focus in on what is his purpose? What is his purpose in creation and where he's moving all of history? And so we need to lift our eyes in the midst of wars and rumors of wars and unrest and Romans 8 where Paul said that earth has been subjected to futility and we're seeing that all around us. And so in hope, we're to look at what God is doing in our midst and where he's moving and the victory that he has done and will have. And so Jehovah reigneth. And we will come now before that God and let's pray. Father, we thank you that I think of Isaiah in the time of great turmoil. He comes uh, into the temple and he's reminded again that the sovereign one is seated on his throne. God, we thank you. We love being your children. We love having you as our Abba and we feel safe. We are in the refuge of Jesus Christ. We have made it to the city of refuge. The justice can no longer touch us because that sword pierced him through in our place. And so we stand in grace. God, we join our hearts and we praise you. And we thank you for the grace that you have bestowed upon us. God, thank you that we are children of God. And I pray now as we open this word, Lord, Holy Spirit, just illuminate these words now to our minds and hearts. Let us understand them with our minds and let our affections uh, be full of love to our God and our wills be take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. So God, come do what no human can do. We look to you to do that in our midst this morning. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Well, I'm, <clears throat> we've been working through Romans 9 and kind of the outline of where we hit now in verse 6. We're looking at the crux, kind of the thesis of the whole chapter. In verse 6, it's not as though the Word of God has failed. And so Paul's showing us, we're looking at Israel, where most of them are sitting now in unbelief as he pens this. And so we're trying to figure out how, how, to, how, how can a whole nation, God made a covenantal promise with them, and they're sitting here in unbelief. How do I know that I'm going to make it to the end in glory? And so we looked at that, and then we saw the clarity in verse 6, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. And so it's not as though the Word of God has failed. Paul's heart is inflamed. He has concern for Israel. He said, I wish that I could be condemned if you could be saved. They're, they're sitting in unbelief, and he has a passion for them. But he also has a concern for the Gentiles to show you that you are secure in the purpose and goal of God. The glory of God is at stake, and you making it to the end. And our axiom is not all Israel is Israel. And he says, you better prove that, Paul. You need to flush that out and help us understand that. And that's what we have been working through. The argument in verses 7 through 13, we began looking at that last week. We saw that the true Israel, the spiritual Israel, the ones who, who would be blessed by the seed, Jesus Christ, all the nations will be blessed through that one, Jesus Christ. And he calls them the children of promise. And so what we've been looking at is how does God get children for this covenant, what he's bringing in? And our answer, he gets them by free, sovereign grace. God gets them by who he wants. He sets his love on whomever he desires. God will get his children by his choice. I think of Jesus with Nicodemus. And he told Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you will not enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And anything that comes in natural, it's natural. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And I tell you, unless you're born again, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless God causes you to have a spiritual birth, what's flesh is flesh, natural. All these descendants of Abraham, unless God acts and saves, they'll be flesh. And unless you're born again, you won't enter in. Unless God makes the child, it will not be the one who is a child of the promise. That is how God gets children. And so Paul is going to show us by the fathers of this nation, Israel, 
that that is how God gets children. And it's been that way from the beginning, and it will always be that way. And so we looked at Abraham. Abraham was called out by God to be the father of this nation, and he was a pagan worshiper. There was nothing good in Abraham. And then in verse 7, last week through Isaac, your descendants will be named. Not through Ishmael. It will come through Isaac. I, it will be the, the children of promise that will be true descendants. Verse 9, at this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. And so God makes a choice between these two kids. He makes a choice in his purpose, his plan, and his program. And he says, I choose Isaac and not Ishmael. And last week we saw in those two boys were two covenants. One was of works and one's of grace. And we see that he gets children, he'll, he'll, he'll get Isaac, and it's going to be when you're 100, Abraham, and Sarah's 90, when there's nothing in your human flesh that you could ever have a child. God is the one who brings in children. God is the one who saves. And now this morning, we'll take up the next two witnesses to prove this point. So if you'll come with me, where we left off was verse 9. For this is the word, I'm sorry, verse 10. And not only this, but there was Rebecca also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, for though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. And so in verse 7, we're told it's through Isaac your descendants will be named Abraham. It will come through Isaac, the child of promise. And now it's not just the physical seed now that will come from Isaac that will be blessed, but the ones from that seed that God chooses from among his physical descendants. God will even choose from them. It will be by his doing. So I love what Paul's doing here. He's driving it deeper, and he's going to take away any arguments the arguments that he has heard many times, I'm sure, as he's preached this truth, the ones that I've heard many times and the ones that I made in my own heart when I heard this truth. <clears throat> so let's consider Isaac and Ishmael again. Ishmael is 13 years old when Isaac is born. I'm sure he's done many sinful things by this age. And that God, uh, that could be maybe why God chose Isaac, because Ishmael is a scoundrel maybe. Or some dad, uh, I'm sorry, he had the same dad, but different moms. And Ishmael's mom was an Egyptian handmaid. Hagar's not Jewish. Of course, God rejected Ishmael. And so Paul's going to take those arguments away in, the, in the, this example that we'll look at this morning. And we're going to look at the example this morning, same mom, same dad, same womb. They're, they're going to be twins. And he says they haven't done anything good or bad yet. They, they haven't even been born. And so even more so, God's going to reverse the natural order of how people were blessed. The older son should be blessed. And God reverses it with the younger son, Jacob, and puts the blessing on him. So I want you to see this. This is to completely rule out any human distinction between Jacob and Esau. No human distinction. There is nothing innately in these two lads that causes one to differ. So the question is, why would God choose the younger to bless? What motivates God to choose Jacob? Why is one chosen to be a child of the promise and the other one isn't? And the answer is so un-American. You're not going to like it. I love it. I love it because it's God's answer. And so let's take it up this morning. I want to set the context then of what Paul's talking about. You don't need to turn to it if you want to go home today. It's from Genesis chapter 25. <clears throat> God comes and he speaks to Rebecca, who is Isaac's wife. And Rebecca has been barren for close to 20 years. And Isaac has been praying that she would be pregnant. Okay. Such beautiful news comes, she has a child. She is pregnant. But Rebecca says, there's something strange going on in my womb. And there's no ultrasounds back then, 
right? Have you ever seen the new ultrasounds? They're so clear. And you have your baby and you're like, man, that doesn't look right. That's not as clear as the picture that I had in the womb. <laughs> These ultrasounds are amazing. I don't even know why I brought that up. <laughs> she asked God, what's going on? What's going on? The answer, there's two nations in your womb. There's a reason you're uncomfortable. You got two nations in, this, in, in your own womb, Rebecca. And you're told two peoples and one of them will serve the other. And in verse 12 of Romans 9, God says it'll be the older who will serve the younger. And so God tells Rebecca what is planned. Two children, the younger one is going to have preeminence and he's going to get the blessing. This blessing that I said would come through a seed. So don't miss this. God is telling the mother the destinies of these two boys within their wombs, and they're going to represent nations. It's amazing stuff. But the question for us this morning as we sit here, why do you love the younger one, God? Jacob. And we're told this morning he hated Esau. Why will Jacob be a child of the promise? And before Paul answers that, maybe ask yourself before I even answer it, what is it about you that made you a child of God? And he tells you why God didn't choose Jacob or Esau. Here's why he didn't do it. You got two genitives here in the Greek describing it. They're modifying this clause this morning in order that God's purpose according to his choice might stand. And we're going to park on that most of the morning. Why? Was Esau a scoundrel? I mean, don't you remember later he sells his birthright for a pot of stew? And Jacob was such a good boy, wasn't he? You've read your Bibles. He's a deceiver. He, he was Ken Murphy growing up. I just, every time I read him, I think, that was me. And sometimes I laugh at who God chooses. Exhibit A, exhibit B. <laughs> Listen to Paul in 1 Corinthians 1. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, and not many mighty, mighty and not many noble but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and to despise, God has chosen. The things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are. That no man should boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in Yahweh, boast in God. I want to be a minister for your joy this morning. And I want you to hear there was nothing in Jacob that commended him to God. There was no merit in Jacob that earned God's blessing. It was all in God. And you're going to see in this passage, it's all in God. And if you sit here going, I'm a nobody, I've accomplished nothing, the world's rejected me, I'm full of sin, I want you to hear that that has nothing to do then with God's choosing. Or you sit here saying, I'm somebody, I've accomplished this, I've accomplished that, I'm just a good guy. All of that is taken away in election. I just want you to see that. That's the way that the world chooses, by your life, your abilities, your looks, your smarts, your talents, your accomplishments. And I just want you to stare that in the face this morning that God chooses because he's free to choose as he wants or as he desires. He is bound by nothing in us or nothing lacking in us. God's electing purpose is in no way based on the distinctives that Esau and Jacob had by birth or by their actions. Let that take your heart away this morning. And I give hope. I always hear people say, I don't like election, it's not fair. <laughs> and I'm looking at it, it's, it's the only way that makes it fair. Because if it's by morality, you, you, you're born into a Satanistic home and you, you never hear about God and you die and go to hell, that's not fair. 
You're born in a moral home, taught about Christ your whole life. You got such an advantage. Election just levels the playing field. There's nothing in you or not in you. Just, if you got someone today, you're going, man, I just think they're too far gone. Election blows it out of the water. It's God, and it's his doing, and he acts upon whom he wishes. And my joy is just watching him draw people in day after day, person after person. And it just, they never make sense. It isn't who I would pick. And God just, it's, it's him. Just be free that it's nothing in you. Isn't that the best news you could ever hear for messed up, broken sinners? It's nothing in me. It's in God. It's in his heart. It's in his actions. And he doesn't choose based on our merit based on our performance and our works. Just look at the text. These two boys are Hebrews of Hebrews. They're purebreds. And he says, for though the twins were not yet even born and had not done anything good or bad. So they're they're not even born yet. They're in the womb. They've done nothing good or bad. And my choice has been made. And I always people say, I wish Paul would just say it clearly. (laughs) How do you say it any clearer? They're not born. They've done nothing good or bad. God made a decision to favor Jacob over Esau in the the womb to give the blessing, not based on what they did, what they would do, what they would be, or what their parents did. The decision was made before they acted. Their behavior did not figure in to God's reason for whom he would choose. That's my only hope. I think it was Spurgeon, he said, I know God chose me before the foundation of the world because he would have never chose me after I was born. (laughs) His choice was not made in reference to any human action or virtue. It was made irrespective of their behavior. The distinction was not in the boys. God's choice choice had nothing to do with ethnicity, works, good virtue, bad vices. It's what we call unconditional. It was absolutely unconditional. And God's election was free from all human influences. And so, so what was it? What made, what made it? And I'm glad you asked, because there's something in the Greek called a hinoclos. And he's going to give you the purpose for why he did it in verse 11. And here, this to me, almost the whole Bible in this little hinoclos. In order that for the purpose, so here it is, for the purpose that God's purpose, according to his choice, might stand. The reason God does this is for the purpose that the purpose that God has according to election might stand. The literal literal Greek is the according to election purpose of God. The according to election purpose of God. This purpose of God is an electing purpose and it must stand. And the way it stands is not because of works. In verse 11 but because of him who calls. God is the one who calls people to life and to himself. He brings Isaacs to life. And there's a lot here. It's probably the key to the whole argument. So I want to park and I want to work this big answer out. So let's look at this word here this morning in verse 11. Purpose. The whole reason for history, the whole reason for the Bible, the whole reason there's a salvation. I want you to see this. This is not small to God or Paul. And so we're going to go deep because God wants us to go here for a full blessing. Anything ring in your mind when you hear the word purpose? When was the last time you heard the word purpose in this letter? Coming back? Go back to Romans 8.28. You only thought we were done with 8.28. I will live in this verse for the rest of my life. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. What's the purpose, God? Verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, who he set his love on before the foundation of the world, chose, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that we who would be the firstborn among many brethren, and these whom he predestined, he called, he gave them life. He created a Isaac like we saw last week. He, he creates his children. He calls them from death to life. 
the ones that he foreknew, he predestined, and then he calls them. And when he calls them, he gives them faith. And they believe. And when they believe the gospel, they're justified. And they're declared not guilty before God. And whom he justifies, he also glorifies. That's the purpose of God. And I want to look at some passages to get this purpose understand. Before I do, I want you just to go back to Romans 9, 6. He says that this purpose might stand. And the word for stand means to continue, not to perish, to last, to endure, that his purpose will, will finish. It will never die. And verse 6, he says, has, has it failed? And the Greek word means to fall down. Has God's purpose fell down? And he's telling us here, no, election keeps his purpose from falling down. And so what we have to get is, what is his purpose? What is, what is the purpose that keeps the promise of God from falling down? And we see it's election. And so turn to Ephesians 1.3. <coughs> Just want to look at a couple verses and then we'll move on. Blessed, verse 3, Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We have every spiritual blessing. I pray we never get over what God has given us in Christ, just as he chose us in him, Christ. So he chose us when? Before the foundation of the world, before even created. He chose us. He, he elected us from the world, what? That we should be holy and blameless before him. And in love, foreknowledge, he predestined us to adoption as sons, how? Through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, purpose. He did it all for his will. Why? To the praise of the glory of of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. And so election is, is it comes to this place. His purpose is that he would be praised forever for the glory of his grace of just choosing sinners to redeem and bring to himself a people. And they just, it's that he'd be praised. God, be praised. And then he moves to Ephesians 1.11 that we've obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to what? According to his purpose. So he predestined us according to this purpose again, who works all things after the counsel of his will, not someone else's will, his, this purpose he predestined to the end that we who were first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. And so you just, he just keeps saying it again and again, predestined purpose that it might end up with people who just praise him and worship him and glorify him for being a gracious God to us. And so I want you to get this. His purpose governs election and every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. His purpose is why all election, justification, glorification, why all these things are in place. Is it, It's for his purpose and what's his purpose, his glory. And so he takes counsel with one being in all things himself, and he's free and he's sovereign to dispense grace on whomever he desires. That all has to tie together, he's saying. Election causes my purpose to stand and not fall. 2 Timothy 1.9, you don't have to turn there. I just want you to listen. He saved us, God, and he called us with a holy calling. Here's that calling. And he called us not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. So it's his purpose that he called us. And grace, which was granted us, it's always in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Before the foundation of the world, he chose us for this purpose, to save us, that we would glorify him. So our God works all things according to his purpose, to the praise of his glory. And I'm just going back to Romans 1, 5. It says, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for what? 
for his name's sake. Everything, the highest purpose is for his glory, for his name's sake. And so there, there's a way all these work together for this purpose that God would be marveled, praised, worshipped forever as a saving God. And so his purpose, John Piper said, God's commitment to do what he does to bring about those who will praise his glory. And that's his commitment, to do what he does, and all the salvation, to bring about those who praise his glory. Everything we've learned in Romans. God has a purpose for it. Remember where Romans is building to? For from him and through him and to him are all things to God be the glory forever. Amen. It's to land us worshiping his glorious name through Jesus Christ. That's whom he's looking for. People like that. Just to worship. He chose me. And there was nothing in me that made him choose. The only thing in me would turn him away from me. And he chose to be favorable. And there's not many wise, mighty, or noble. God just set his love on you. Romans 9, 11. For though these twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, the, it's the word for election, according to his election, would stand. Not because of works, but because of him who calls. And so this glorious purpose, he says, according to election, is so this purpose stands to praise him and worship him as the God of grace. And the only way it's going to work, it accords with election. If, if, if there's another way, it all breaks. It's all of him. It has to be from him, through him, and to him. It's the only way it all ties together. So this election causes the purpose of God being praised to stand. So it doesn't fall. And so his purpose is that everyone in this room this morning would sing his praises. Our singing should be more robust. We should proclaim his glory that God has set his favor and love upon us and brought us into all the blessings of Romans 8 by free, sovereign grace that was undeserved and unmerited, just a pure act of grace. That's God's purpose. And it's going to go on for all of eternity, we see in Revelation. And so not to us, not to us, but to your name be glory. Amen. The futility of living for us to be praised, I don't think anything could be more contrary to the purpose of God. You get glory. The glory of God. His ultimate self-determination. Doing as he pleases. The sovereign one. With none who can thwart his will and no one can stop his purposes. He chooses and he creates the one. Ones who will receive this infinite great blessing. And so I pray Praise him for his free sovereign grace. Walk around and praise him. Lift his name up. Tell of his wonders. Make much of him. Go to the nations. Give your life to him. I, well, I guess what I'm asking this morning, enter into his purpose. Here's God's purpose. Have you entered into it? Come enter in to God's purpose. This is it, Southside. <laughs> Wake up to God's great purpose for this world and ourselves. And it's, it's him. Be awake to that. There's something better than you and your plans and your life. Be awake to this great purpose that he is working perfectly. And so I want you to hear in our text this morning, God's purpose accords with election. If God does not act an unconditional election. Let's just say if he's bound by men's free will, man's self-determination, if it's merited by our works, if it's merited by our faith, if it's merited by our goodness, it all falls apart. His purpose breaks if you add us into it. The chain of grace, you just added the weakest link. Next week, the very essence of God's glory, Moses says, show me your glory that he's free to choose whoever he desires and put this blessing on whomever he wants. This is so rich. And if that's not clear enough, 
Come to verse 11. He concludes with one final statement. And we're going to flush this out because it's so rich. According, so that the God's purpose according to his choice would stand. Not because of works, but because of him who calls. So not by works. Do you, do you think Paul's trying to make a point? <laughs> they haven't done anything good or bad. Not by works. Before they were born. This, this, this might even be he's thinking of later works uh, af- after he's born. Whatever he's after here, he's saying it doesn't matter when the works were done. It doesn't matter if they're done when before in the womb. It doesn't matter after you're born. These works will never get you God's favor. So that the purpose of election stands without any consideration of your works. Why do you keep putting them back in? Paul just keeps pulling them back out. Get, it, get them out of there. They're never going to be that which merits you the favor of God. And so, but it's not by works, but because of him who calls. And this is where it gets really interesting, and I spent quite a bit of time on this. You're thinking, why did he spend so much time? That was that, is that the phrase that you were expecting? What's been this whole letter? What, what do you think? Not by works, what would you expect Paul to say? What, what does he contrast with works the whole letter? Faith. It's not by works. We maintain that man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. He just keeps showing you it's not by works. It's by faith. The, the whole Bible is that. Come, look at Romans 9.30. I'm just going to read that. <laughs> what shall we say then? A summary that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel pursuing a law of righteousness did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Law, faith, that's all it's been. And that's the issue. And now all of a sudden, Paul drops it. And he contrasts not of works, but of him who calls. So it isn't, he doesn't contrast it with faith. It, it, what's going to make it stand it is not by your works, but by God who calls and gives life to you. He takes dead corpses spiritually and he makes you alive. So here's the big distinction I want you to get. It's not anything good. Nothing good that made him choose you. And I'm going to say that's faith even. is isn't your faith that made him choose you. That quarter of time that we looked at in Romans 8, God looks down the quarter of time and eternity and he saw that you were going to have faith. So he chose you. He saw that Jacob would have faith. And and if if you take that, the whole passage falls apart. Even verse 14. What should we say then? Is there injustice with God? They're going to charge Paul saying God's unjust. If God made a choice between us because he saw, he foresaw who would believe, there's no injustice in that, is there? There's no injustice. Oh, that's fair. I like that. But what it has nothing to do with anything human, good or bad, or the choice that you made, the charge of injustice comes flying. That's not fair. That's not fair. And you might have that charge in your heart this morning, and we're going to look at that next week. But if I tell you the choice was made because God saw your choice in later life, there's no charge of injustice, just smiling. Uh, It's fair to pick based on those who picked you. I like that. But that's not what God is saying here. And so before I answer it, I just want to answer one question I think is important for you. What happened to faith then? Where did faith go? This whole letter I'm writing for the obedience of faith. Justified by faith, not by works. Are you throwing that away, Paul? No way. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God to save to everyone who believes. Romans 1 through 5 is the faith in Christ. Lack of faith is in Romans 11 why Israel is going to be cast off. So hear this because it's big. Paul's making the distinction, and you have to understand this really well or you're going to fall off a cliff. Justification is by faith alone. The only way to ever be justified is to believe this gospel. And election is not by faith alone. It's by God's calling. Justification is by faith. Election is by God's calling. His choosing, hear this, not your choosing. That's where we get it wrong. It's his choosing, not your choosing, which is called faith. 
So he makes a clear distinction. God chooses us in order that we might believe. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness because God chose Abraham. So the ground of our election is not works that you did in the past, not works that you're going to do today, and not works of what you're going to do tomorrow. And it's not faith in the past, it's not your faith today, and it's not your faith in the future. The grounds of God's calling is, uh, in the contrast here, is him who calls. Romans 8, 29 through 30, the ones he foreknew, he predestined, and whom he predestined, he called. My election is the grounds of my calling. So when you're called to life and faith, it was God's election, his choice of you, an eternity past that brought about this faith. So conclusion. What is determinative? What is it that determin determines if I get God's favor and all the blessings that come through Jesus Christ? It's not my will, but God's. I want you to hear this. There's only one autonomous, sovereign will in all the universe, and it's God's. <laughs> It belongs to God alone. And he's free to choose as he pleases. He is the free, willing one. And he calls you to himself based on nothing but pure grace. Then you choose Christ to be your Lord and Savior with your free will that God made willing. And so he'll take a dead corpse and he'll give you life and now you will freely choose Jesus Christ. But what made you choose him and what made you alive was God. And so you praise God if you have faith this morning. It's a gift of God, not of works, so that nobody will boast. Acts 13, 48, I love it when Paul, Peter's preaching, and they, the, the, I think it's Paul, and, and it says, all who were appointed to eternal life believed. Augustine, the great saint, said, God does not choose us because we believe but he chooses us so that we will believe. Faith is the condition of justification. It's why I fought for it. I've preached it. I've begged you. It is, it is how you get saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. But faith is not the condition of election, but his sovereign election. In this passage, according to his purpose, is that he calls and that he would be praised alone for his glorious grace. So I believed because God chose me. And in time and space, he called me and awoke me from my slumber and my sin and my sleep. And, and then when I awoke, my chains fell off. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. The freest choice I've ever made in my life was to follow Jesus Christ. I treasure it because he made me willing. I'm the most willing guy around to follow Jesus. But before he acted, I would not come. Oh, Israel, you're unwilling. You're stiff-necked. You will not come. So verse 12. It was said to her, I need to get moving. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger. It's just so sweet, isn't it? My heart is just taken up with the gospel it's difficult to understand, but I think I get it. God chose me. He set his love on me. Nothing based in me, not my works, my merit. I just feel so free in that. Praise be to God for setting his love on me before the foundation of the world. Let's go home. Where's Thomas? Let's sing. The doxology. But Paul says, hold on one second. There's verse 13. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Paul, you are cooking my grits. Can't you just leave well enough alone? <laughs> Don't make me mess with verse 13. It just, it undoes me. Jacob, I loved. I like that. I'm warming up to it. God loved me before the foundation of the world. Esau, I hated. I've been commanded, love my enemies. Don't hate them. What is this? Go, go to where Greg read this morning. Flip over to Malachi. Paul is quoting from Malachi chapter 1. <clears throat> Malachi chapter 1, and I'm not going to get too lost in this. I'll pick it up next week. 
So let's go to it and close this out. The original context in Genesis, Rebecca's told there's two nations in your womb. You've got the destinies of two nations that are going to flow from these two boys in your womb. And big things are going to come out of this distinction. Jacob I loved. We drink that fruit this morning. Esau I hated. Maybe we could tone that down just a little bit because little kids, you shouldn't use that word. Love less feels better. I like that. I, it, it's like a poetic form maybe. God's just, it's like poetic. Love and hate. But I just want you to see that it's actually defined what God means in our text because he quotes it from Malachi. And so what happened, because God had this choice of Esau, I want you to see what it means that God is against him. Malachi 1.1. If it sounds familiar, it should. You heard it this morning. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved me? How have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have set my love on Jacob. How have I loved you? I set my choice, my electing love on Jacob. But I've hated Esau. And what happens when God puts that upon a human? It's a whole nation, as Greg pointed out. And I've made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. So Edom says, we have been beaten down but we'll return and we'll build up the ruins. And thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I'll tear them down. And men will call them the wicked territory and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. Your eyes will see this and you'll say the Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. And so I want you to see that this choice isn't just loving less, it's opposed. It's set against him. And you're going to keep building up, and I'm going to tear it back down. And he's just sharing what has been pronounced upon this, this human in the nation that has proceeded from it. And so I want you to know that God's hatred is holy. It will never be like ours. We, we stumble over any word like this because we bring our own humanity, and our hatred is always usually selfish. God is holy and pure. But the passage states... Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Why? Israel, I love you because I chose to. I chose Jacob to manifest my glory. And Esau I hated. Apart from God's choosing, we all should have the wrath and hatred of God upon us. Remember back to Romans 1.18 should have been upon us for all of eternity except the mercy of God and the grace. Apart from God's choosing and calling and justifying and glorifying His grace, we would all be objects of God's wrath. And God has punished them as a wicked city, which means they were wicked. And they deserve to be punished for God opposes them and He hates them. Election is always unconditional in the Bible. And what you'll see is that judgment, every time you see it, is conditional and deserved. And the Word of God, condemnation is always tied to your sin. And so we stand on the brink here. We're going we're gonna to flush it out. It's a tricky one of a great mystery. That God chooses whom He'll save from their sin and who will be lost in their sin. And I've always looked at it as a car out of alignment. He just lets you go your bent course and you'll go and you'll go be wicked. And we're going to try to work all that out. And I know it's a lot, heavy stuff. And so brothers and sisters, we're in very high waters here and it would be easier to not look at chapters like Romans 9. But it's worth sailing to drink up such beautiful truths of the sweet grace of God. And these are difficult truths and I've wrestled with them in my own heart for decades. 
the, the opposite of really what most of us have been taught or think. So why are we doing this, Pastor? What's wrong with you? Can't we just leave this alone? If Paul did and God did, I would. I just came because I want a sermon on stress, and now I'm more stressed than I've ever been in my life. Let's journey God's word, and I just, again, I beg you, let him teach us to a truth that is changing my life in so many beautiful ways. God gets children of promise by free sovereign grace so that we would praise him for all of eternity for his glory. And so I guess as I close out, have you entered into his purpose? Have you, have you entered in through salvation, faith alone? Have you entered in now to what he wants is for us to magnify and tell of his glories and show the world and, and just let everyone know there's, there's free grace in Christ. And just that's his purpose, that everyone would praise him. There's praise for this gospel. And so we, we enter in, and that, that's our purpose for existence. That's our purpose for living. And so many people just stay down here, and just I just like cross, and I'm saved, and that's all I want to think about. And for what? For, for this purpose to just praise Him. Give glory to God with your lives, your mouths, the rest of your days. I, I just got up this morning, and I was making coffee, getting drink, all these things, and all, every step was just, my God's merciful. He's merciful to me. I can't get over this. It wasn't anything in me. He's merciful. And I just, I don't think we should be Eeyores. I, I really think, it, enter in to the most amazing truth ever. God chose you. He loved you. He's opened your eyes. He's shown you Jesus. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is yours. Just live into it and, and let the world know. Let's tell everyone we can. Hallelujah. Second, do you have strong assurance that his purposes will not fail? Because of election, it stands. Nothing can thwart his purpose because it was nothing in you. You didn't merit it. You can't demerit it. You, it's just his, 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 his uh, choice, his, his purpose is going to stand because of election. And so he's going to bring you to glory, back to the chain of grace. Nothing can break it. Nothing can stop it. He wants children who are so confident in his purpose, his grace. He'll finish it. I'm not running around just always full of anxiety. I, I'm filled with confidence in God. And so if you entered in that his purposes stand, I'm not going to fall away. His purposes with Israel are working out exactly the way he's planned, called, decreed. He's not, he's not failing. And so I just want you to quit acting like he's going to fail with you. What a, what a powerful thing to live confident in the grace of God because his election, it's going to happen. It's not based on you. It's based on God. <laughs> Isn't that better than me telling you, go fight hard and hold to Jesus till you die? <laughs> You'd walk out of here and fail in the next 10 minutes. God's going to hold you and he's going to change you and bring you to glory because it's his purpose. And he chose you based on just his working. I'm going to work in your life and I will bring you to glory. How's that? Number three, I know so many people who know this doctrine of election well. And I'm begging you this morning, don't stop short there. Don't just have it in your noggin. Don't just use it to beat Arminians. The purpose of it is to the praise of his glory and grace. And if you stop short with just academic understandings of the decree, was it before the fall, after the fall, and you got all these little things, and you got all your grids, and you know it. And, and I, I told you before, I had this guy who, who was in my college group, and every kid who walked in, he'd say, do you think God loves everybody the same? And he'd get, open his Bible and pull out Jacob and Esau and just start skinning everybody. Has this truth taken over your heart? To praise God for free grace. You see it, you love it, you sing about it. 
You tell it in chapter 10 to everyone who will listen. I, I can't shut up about his grace. Can you? Has that what this doctrine done to your heart? Fourth, the joy of my life is that before the foundation of the world, God said, can I loved? George, I loved. Delene, I loved. Can you get over that? Nothing in you, nothing you ever did or could. God just chose to set his love upon you. And when God loves you, man, good things happen. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. What do we got to boast in? Except in free, electing love. Except in the cross of Christ. That you bring this salvation because Christ has done the work. I boast in Christ alone. I praise you for your free love alone. I forget. I love that this has nothing to do with me. I just fall at your feet and receive this free gift, this amazing love that you have for sinners. I'm not going to spend all my days arguing and questioning if it's fair. God, I just worship you. You've declared this. You've tied it to your purpose. You've tied election to the purpose for why you made all of this and created it. We are on holy ground. And we fall at your feet. And we praise you and we worship you for the gift of salvation. I got nothing in my hands to bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. God, thank you for doing that work and the hearts that know you here this morning. God, we'll never be able to stop praising you as a corporate church together. And I thank you for this. And it's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen.